Good morning. Good morning. It's eight weeks since Pentecost. They call this the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And that means that all this time after the Pentecost celebration of the Holy Spirit is seen as uh, God sort of working out the Spirit in the midst of his people. So this is a long, quote, season, and um, God's still working, right? So that's why we call it that. I want to uh, say good morning to folks. Join us online. Uh, we're glad that you're with us. And I'm going to go ahead and invite us to share the wave of Christ with each other and make sure we wave at these cameras, one above uh, Brother Scott here <laughs> and uh, one here. That way, Folks know we're uh, saying hello to them. Church school, following worship, we'll do our sort of 10 minutes of coffee and, and gabbing. Um, refreshments today, Kathy Daniels brought them. Uh, am I correct? Yes, so thanks to Kathy for that. Um, the altar flowers, though I, I pause because not just the altar, we've got a, several different arrangements around uh, by the Butts family, and Marsha has, um, well, it's printed in your bulletin, but we, lo we forgot a few in there too, did we not? They've got a lot of birthdays and anniversaries in their family, so this is, this is sort of a big family celebration week, I'll say, and maybe even a little more in a week. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, there might be somebody having a birthday today. Um, so that's all I'll say. Um, but thanks for the, bringing the, the nice flowers with us this morning, as uh, folks often do. This week, the main time of meeting will be Tuesday. The Finance Committee will meet at 6 to uh, go over church finances and so forth, and then... Um, administrative council at seven o'clock up in the fireside room taking care of things and I know I forgot something I almost said thank you to Nancy thinking this would be her last Sunday but we have a five Sunday month so we get you for one more uh, Sunday as our liturgist before we do that, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday, of course, and that means we will go to the Timbers uh, Assisted Living Nursing uh, Facility and share a worship service at 2 p.m. You'll hear me say that again next Sunday, but if you want to go, join us and sing some hymns and be a part of that next Sunday. Not today, but next Sunday at 2 Um Boy, I'm going to think I'm forgetting something, but um, I believe I've caught my notes, so I'm going to turn things over to Nancy. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. We'll be reading this responsively. When the world divides us, When the world calls us orphaned. Come, Holy Spirit, make us stand. When the world leads us astray. Come, Holy Spirit, call us home. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. It's number 103 in your hymnal, and we'll be singing all four verses.
Please be seated and join me in the prayer of confession. We'll be reading this in unison. God of majesty and power, we tremble when we become aware of who you are. Who are we that you should visit us or expect something from us? We confess our preference for the predictable. We admit our resistance to your spirit. We acknowledge our misuse of your gifts to us. We prefer our divisions to your unity. Forgive us, O oh God of power and might, that we might forgive. Draw us back into a right relationship with you and with one another. Amen. God has reached out to us once again, offering salvation, making us whole, drawing us into community where life is integrated and filled with purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. Our first reading is Exodus 3, 1 through 14. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, where there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pe Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egypt Egyptians oppress them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, who is his name, or what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Our second reading is Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
Please stand for the reading of the gospel, Mark 9, 14 through 29. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered, answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and be, becomes rigid. And I ask your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, help us, have compassion on us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out only through prayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Let us pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts assembled here, joining far and wide, be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've asked Dan if he would show some slides this morning. It's not a whole slideshow, so hang in there, but a few. If you could put the first one up. And uh, this is a plantation house. You may not have seen something called a plantation house that looks like that. Hmm? Usually when we think of a plantation house, we think of some large colonial looking place, antebellum we might say, before the Civil War, that is very ornate and decorative with a very, uh, you know, meticulously cared for lawn and outbuildings. Of course, all of that beauty was created by enslaved people who were considered property in the southern United States. But this is a different kind of plantation building or house. This is located in, near a village called Bedford, Kentucky. Bedford, Kentucky is about 15 miles away from the Ohio River and north central Kentucky. It's a little bit east of Louisville, Kentucky, and it's out in the boondocks. Um, a few years ago when Liz and I went camping in uh, Kentucky, we stopped for a, a day, I guess, one day, in this area, and we joined an archaeological dig through the local history society. The history society would sponsor after, or mornings and afternoons, I guess, with groups of people on this property, and they would chart areas to be excavated and searched 
for lost items, you know, bottles and glass and clay and china cups and whatever from this plantation. This plantation belonged to a man named William Gatewood. And even though it looks like Mr. Gatewood might not <clears throat> have had the most decorated plantation, Mr. Gatewood still, under the law of Kentucky at the time, quote, owned, end quote, people. And one of the people was named Henry Bibb. If you could uh, flip, Dan. And so this is Elizabeth on the excavation. So Liz here is taking a trowel in a specially kind of set off grids or areas and very carefully scraping it. And then if you could flip the next one, Dan, thanks. Putting it into this little scoop and then we put the scoop into little buckets or tell you the truth, they were empty cat litter containers. It's the archeologist's secret. And then, if you could flip again, Dan, uh, taking that and putting it in a screen box where you then shake the stuff a little bit and go over it with your hand to see what you find in there. And Liz actually managed to find some rare item, and I can't remember exactly what they called it, but the uh, professional people there were kind of excited. She stumbled onto something. And this is all from an area where this man named Henry Bibb lived. So I want to tell you about Henry Bibb. Henry Bibb was born in the early 1800s on that property in northern Kentucky. And he was, quote, owned. I don't like to say owned because in God's eyes he was not. But according to the human law of the time, that's how he was considered. But Mr. Bibb grew up there and was treated very poorly. And Mr. Bibb, Henry Bibb, um, who was beaten and given very, very inadequate food and made to live in places that probably made that building look like the Taj Mahal, Henry Bibb grew and became one of the most impressive Christian people I've ever read about. He grew in that area, and he actually attended a Methodist church. And in those days, this is a tradition from John Wesley in England, there was what was called a class meeting card. In other words, the class meetings were like small group Bible studies in our era. Congregations would be sort of divided up into groups of people who would meet in the middle of the week and study scripture and pray and kind of help each other out, you know, with, <laughs> well, Jim, how is, how is it going with your bad temper? You know, you'd kind of confess and try to support each other to walk a better walk. And uh, oftentimes, these class meetings, they were called, had little tickets that were then punched um, it was an attendance thing. So all in favor of us passing out class meeting tickets so that somebody can punch your attendance. All right, I thought I'd try. So uh, anyway, so they were very dedicated Christian people. Mr. Henry Bibb, as a young adult, was in one of these. And um, oddly enough, in the very same church, was the man who claimed to own him, William Gatewood. So you have a Methodist person who's enslaved, and you have a Methodist owner of the farm plantation who claimed to own him, all in the same congregation. Well, Henry Bibb was taught things out of the Bible very selectively. And he talks about this in his autobiography, that the kind of things enslaved people were taught from the Bible were distortions, twisted sort of interpretations of texts, like servants or, according to some translations, slaves, be obedient to your masters, right? 
What better to reinforce abuse than to have somebody say, it's in the Bible, here it is, right? Of course, the rest of the Bible was not engaged. And Henry Bibb talked about the way in which the Scriptures were distorted and um, things taken out of context and twisted to try to keep him down. And he was a very dedicated Christian man. He was not disputing um, the validity of Christianity or the message of the gospel. He was a Bible-believing person. He just knew that the Bible that was being pushed at him was a very sick interpretation. And so, as he was a young man, he uh, developed a relationship. And his sweetheart's name was Melinda, and they talked about getting married, at least married in the best way they could under the existing laws. And Henry told Melinda, he said, before we step ahead in this relationship, you need to know two things about me. He said, number one, I am a Christian man, and I will seek God for the rest of my life and try to honor his word and live his ways. You need to know that about me if you haven't already <laughs> learned that. And he said, and secondly, uh, along these lines, I will be seeking freedom, and you need to know that. I believe God has created us for freedom, okay? And so, a little bit later, when it came time for them to try to escape, Henry Bibb recalled that he did this. Interesting language. He said, I determined to leave that night, and I kneeled before the great I Am and prayed before setting off on my freedom journey. The great I am. He's talking about God, okay? And he's using literary language, right? But he did not make up that language. The great I am language is the language found in Exodus chapter 3 that Nancy read. It's Moses talking with God language. The great I am. It's very mysterious language, isn't it? Right? You know? If, some, if you were to go and, and have an interaction at a store downtown and tell someone, you know, may God bless your day, they're going to know what you're trying to convey. If you go downtown and have the same interaction and as you're getting your, you know, item, say, may the great I am sustain your day. How do you think folks are going to look at you? I might try it, though, actually, just for fun, you know? But it's a very mysterious kind of language. But this is reference to God's name, the great I Am. You see, in Exodus chapter 3, very early in the Exodus story, but still a little bit along in the story, far enough along, where Moses has realized he's not one of the Egyptian oppressors, that his identity is with the Hebrew people who are being oppressed, that he is a Hebrew who needs to come to terms with the fact that he doesn't belong with all the powerful manipulators, right? And he's sort of out in his own wilderness at this time, trying to figure out life, and he comes upon the burning bush. And the language of God's voice out of this bush is so provocative. We often overlook it, I think, but it sort of builds up to this concluding language, the great I am, or I am who I am, or I am who am. At first, God identifies himself as the one who was with Moses' ancestors. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and we might say with, not irreverently, the rest of the gang, you know, all of the people who had gone before. So, Moses should know what God is trying to tell him. And then, 
when Moses is, you know, very apprehensive about what God is asking him to do, uh, Moses basically does what many of us do. Well, I'm not sure I'm the one for that job, and, you know, I'm not sure that's my... And God promises to be with Moses. Do you get that part? That's no joke, because that gets us through, right? But the part I want to emphasize today was at the end of the reading, because Moses, and let's not be too hard on the guy, Moses wants to know the very name of God. Not who God was with, you know, Grandpa Isaac and those fellas back in the day. Not who God will be with him, he promises, right? Because in a human world, promises often get broken. God, Moses, rather, wants to know who God is right then and there. Okay, who should I tell them has sent me? I want to know your name. And God responds, I am who I am. One of the most mysterious statements in all of Scripture, right? I am who I am. I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there in front of a bush that's on fire but not going anywhere, and a voice claiming to be God says, okay, I'll tell you all about me. I am who I am. I'm not sure that's going to help me convince other people. Hmm? I'm going to be confused myself, and I'm not sure that's going to really back up my mission. So what's going on with this language? The great I am has said, I am who I am. Here's where, if you're a Bible geek, you look at all the different interpreters and the scholars over the year, and some suggest... This might be a little bit up in the clouds, but some suggest that the real importance of what's being said here by God is God is referring to his authority power to create being itself. In other words, I'm the one who makes anything that exists, exist. Right? I'm not the one who just showed up and took some of this stuff already here and put it together in a fancy way. I'm the very originator of all that exists. And if you want to play philosopher, I even invented existence. Right? I am who I am. Now, in Genesis, there's a fancy term theologians use to describe the creation, that God created out of nothing. Have you heard of that? I don't know anybody else who can create out of nothing, right? In the Latin, it's called creatio ex nihilo. Creatio. Creation out of nothing. Right? Talented people can take a little bit of stuff and make something nice. God takes nothing and makes everything. You with me? That's who Moses is talking to at the burning bush. Whoa. Whoa. We see some of this in Mark chapter 9. The story Nancy read from Mark chapter 9, it's, it's a wonderful story. It's a very human story, even somewhat in terms of the expression of Jesus to the people, because there is a man who loves his son, and his son is ill. He has, I suppose today we would say, a, a kind of seizure disorder, not exactly sure why, and the disciples evidently tried to heal the boy, and they were unsuccessful, right? And so then the focus uh, turns to Jesus himself. And the father is like, you know, any, any person who is so heartbroken in that moment, I could see myself doing this, who has said, Lord, you know, just, just help my boy. 
But the language is rather interesting here because the father begs, according to the translation Nancy read, quote, if you are able to do anything, help us. It sounds fairly innocent, right? The guy's desperate. I would say the same thing probably. If you're able to help, just help. And it's a moment in which Jesus and his compassion have an edge, you see, because we may want Jesus to respond, there, there, I know you're a good father, and I will do my best to help you. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says something that to this day gets argued about by Bible scholars. He says, according to some earlier translations of the Bible, quote, if you can believe all things are possible, then I can help. It's, right? And that's not a bad translation. That's not a bad translation. The focus is on the man's belief here, right? In other words, I want to help you, but you need to believe. Okay? It's not a bad translation. And yet... There are other translations that take it just a little different direction. And instead of Jesus saying, if you can believe to the man, if you, sir, can believe, these other translations have Jesus sort of quoting the man's words back to him in a way that's kind of indignant. The man says, basically, sir, if you're able, help me, right? And as Nancy read it, there's an exclamation point, I believe, there. If you are able? In other words, Jesus is confronting the man because the man is not openly admitting Jesus' ability. You with me? Sir, if you're able, help me. If you are able, it's like, don't you know who you're talking with? In the New International Version of the Bible, there's a question mark there. If you can? Question, if you can? In other words, sir, you're questioning my ability? It doesn't sound very pastoral in that moment, but Jesus is in essence pointing out, of course I am able. Right? You get that? Have you ever had somebody say excuse me to you, but they weren't really apologizing? It's, think about it. It's like one of these moments. If you have a teacher turn and say, excuse me, he or she is not apologizing. Maybe mom too, huh? Grandma and grandpa. Right? It's like one of those moments. If I am able... Jesus is tough, but it's a toughness because he is bringing the power to heal. See, he's bringing the power to heal. I think in many respects, while I understand the focus on the man's faith, right? He needs to believe. This is a moment where the primary, the first focus should be on Jesus and his power. Because if the man coming to Jesus with his son, if the man really understands Jesus and his power, he's going to believe. You with me? With me? Think about that. Right? He's going to believe. Henry Bibb was a fellow who approached God in that way. Not in the questioning way, but in the way that confessed his power. The power of God. The great I am. Henry Bibb got it. See? Henry Bibb understood. He wasn't just dealing with some supernatural power that sort of made some things better. He was dealing with I am. The great I am. And because of that, Henry Bibb went on and did wonderful things, see? You know this guy who was never taught 
properly to read and write. He had probably two and a half weeks, I should say, of formal education. <laughs> when he got free, there was a pastor in the Detroit area that taught him some of the rudiments of, it, of reading and writing. He had picked up a few things along the way by well-meaning people, but uh, two and one half weeks. You know what he was doing when he died? He was editing a newspaper in uh, what is now Windsor, Canada. A newspaper editor. Think about that. The guy with two and a half weeks of formal education who was taught that the Bible wanted him to be subservient, that he didn't need to learn to read and write. This fellow went on not only to be a writer, but to be an editor of other people's writing. You get that? I don't know any way to say it, but that's darn near like having something created out of nothing, right? In your life. And I believe that the people in our world and here, right here with us, the people who accomplish great things are the people who know God as the great I am. The God who can literally create out of nothing. If you believe that, there's nothing you cannot accomplish on behalf of God. Follow? close with a story. I told it once in August of 2019, so I'm testing you. Somehow, I wasn't, here. I wasn't a part of the congregation in August. I get it, but just in case you're going to trip me up, Pastor, you told that story before. I know that. So. <clears throat> when Liz and I got married, we took a honeymoon out to New York State and then up into Vermont. One of the places we stopped in New York State was Auburn, New York. It's in the, quote, Finger Lakes region, really nice area. And we visited the home of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, who was enslaved herself in Maryland and up and down the, you know, down the East Coast and actually helped people escape slavery, Harriet Tubman was an example of someone who came from nothing and did everything. And she did it because God was with her. When Liz and I were touring the place, the tour guide happened to be an um, African Methodist Episcopal Zion church pastor, I think he was, right? AME Zion. Wonderful guy. He caught my attention with a statement that is with me to this day. And he talked about Harriet Tubman's life, and he said this. He said, have you ever noticed there are some people who have so much and do so little? And there are other people who have so little and do so much. The second group of folks are the people who know God as the great I am. So what kind of person will you be? Amen. I invite you to turn with me in the hymnal. I believe Dan has it projected too, probably. It's from uh, number 109, as we sort of confess together our conviction about God's ability. Now, let's stand and do this, and then I know Nancy will introduce the hymn after that. Is that all right? Is it? Oh, 106. That's what you get for having a pastor who can't see. 106. I will lead if you will respond with me. This is a confession, if you will, taken from Martin Luther King Jr. Is someone here moving toward the twilight of life and fearful of that which we call death? Why be afraid? God is able. 
Is someone here on the brink of despair because of the death of a loved one, the breaking of a marriage, or the waywardness of a child? Why despair? God is able to give us the power to endure that which cannot be changed. Is someone here anxious because of bad health? Why be anxious? Come one day. God is able. Surely God is able. Please remain standing for the hymn of response, Stand By Me, number 512 in your hymnal. We'll be singing all five verses. had a number of prayer items shared with me today. Of course, items isn't the right word. We're talking about folks who are um, oftentimes in serious need, and I'll share some of that. But also a couple of items of good news. I'm going to ask your indulgence as I share a piece of good news I received this week um, that warmed my heart and boosted me. Um, the book that I've written, Compelling Lives, should be released hopefully this week. And uh, initially, when I wrote that book, I was um, under an agreement with the United Methodist Church Publishing Office in Nashville, Tennessee. And about a year after that agreement and I started writing the book, due to the financial um, problems in our denomination as a whole and the funding that whole publishing operation closed down. So I was orphaned by um, the only real publishing operation that dealt with this kind of literature in the denomination. It's a sign of some of the turmoil in our uh, church and the funding issues that it faced. Uh, fortunately, the book was picked up by a publisher in Eugene, Oregon, named Whiff and Stock. That's just the name of two people, their last name. 
And Wiffenstock is a very highly regarded uh, publisher of academic books. But they do write books that try to take academic subjects and also make them relatable. And that was sort of my aim. So the book was going to come out actually over a week ago, I guess, Liz. She's been kind of walking with me on this and was ready to go and be published and put on all the websites and everything. And yet, um, a group of scholars intervened. And that's not always a good thing, but it was in this case. Uh, some scholars read my manuscript and they said, whoa, 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 we want your book to be in a special series of books we're publishing, which is very nice. And this same, these books that they were sponsoring are also published out of that publishing office in Eugene, Oregon, but they're under a little different name. It's called an imprint in the publishing business. And so the uh, in-house folks had to scramble a bit and redesign a cover and some of that kind of stuff. But uh, this is a series of books. Two have been released so far. I believe mine will be the third. In a series called uh, Wesleyan and Methodist Explorations. It's led by um, a very well-regarded professor at Duke University named Daniel Castello. And Daniel, uh, Dr. Castello, and some others have been very, very supportive. And so what that means is my book will be sort of taken up into their own communication and promotion. It's not just standalone. And I'm very grateful for that. So um, this is a series that probably is the premier series, to be quite honest, in pan-Methodism, not just United Methodist Church, but all Wesleyan and Methodist kind of schools and, the, you know, theological traditions. So I'm honored to be a part of that. Anyway, just want to share that. So thanks. I appreciate it. Now, uh, another item of celebration is that a few of us from the congregation were able to attend the wedding of Nicole Criffield and Jeremy Wagers in uh, Bremen, Indiana yesterday, and it was a beautiful day uh, with a little breeze, and they had a nice wedding ceremony, and uh, before we left to say goodbye, Lane said, I don't know that I'll be in church tomorrow, Pastor, and I said, I understand. But uh, so if you get a chance, congratulate Nicole or uh, Rosemary and Lane, of course, uh, on a big day. And uh, now if I turn to some things that are uh, very sad, it's all there in our life, I want to note the passing of a friend of Rich Bressler's. And Rich, where'd you go, Rich? Oh, there you are. Um, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your friend's name correctly. Larry Jose, is it? He's nodding, yes. Okay. I want to make sure I, I pronounced your friend's name correctly, but a friend of Rich who passed away. And then we received word um, just the other day that Bishop David Bard's mother has passed away. Uh, and the bishop's mom lived in Duluth, Minnesota. Our bishop grew up there. And so I do have a, a note outside uh, in the narthex for anyone who would like to write a note of condolence to the bishop on the passing of his mom. Now, Matt White, also a friend of Rich's, having heart surgery. So we want to keep Mr. White in our prayers. And Mrs. Rumley has had some illness. And Scott, I, I've neglected to ask you if she, did she have the surgery or is she scheduled? So she's in the early stages of recuperating, huh? Is that fair? Okay. Well, we're sorry for your mother's illness and we're going to pray for her. And Fran Skibby has uh, had some illness and yet has gone through some testing. I haven't been able to speak with her yesterday or today, but uh, we're going to trust that she's got a plan to help her, and we'll keep praying for Fran and Frank anyway. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. 
Lord, we know that you are able. You are the great I am. You make something wonderful out of nothing. And Lord, we trust you with all that we bring today. The gladness and the sadness. Ask that you be with those who are going through the valley of grief and loss. That you be with those who face surgery those who are hungry in the world, and those that are in areas torn by war. Lord, we ask that you move in our hearts, then, that we will be aware, and that we will love and serve as you would have us love and serve. We ask all of this in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. The music played during the offertory is Be Thou My Vision. The ushers will bring the offering forward during the doxology. and for the doxology. the giver of all good things and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you we ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory may these gifts bring shelter to the homeless comfort to the sick rest to the weary and hope to the hopeless just as you multiplied the offering of fish and the loaves that were freely given for others we pray that you would multiply these, our offerings, to you, 
and accomplish with them more than we could ask or imagine. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 2173 in the Faith We Sing book. We'll be singing all three verses. in the presence and power of the great I am, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.